I call to order the August 22nd, regular, 2023 regular meeting of the Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission. Thanks again for your patience while our commissioners were stuck in traffic. Uh, for the record, my name is Barbara Howard and I serve as chair of the commission. Just a reminder to please silence your cell phones and any other electronic devices and speak clearly into the microphone, whether you're speaking up here at the dais or if you're giving public testimony. Would the clerk please call the roll so that we may verify the presence of our quorum? Commissioner Bjornberg. Present. Booty. Present. Chair Howard. Present. Melblum. Present. Nystrom is absent. Vice Chair Sandbull. Here. Mastin is absent. Struthers. Struthers. Present. Vanderake. Here. There are seven members present. Let the record reflect, we do have quorum and that commissioners Nystrom and Mastin provided proper notice that they have a conflict this afternoon, so their absences are excused. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda for this meeting. We'll work from the agendas that are available over by the clerk. I'll go through the agenda and sort out any items to be withdrawn, continue to a future meeting, which items will be discussed and which items will be put on a consent agenda to be approved as recommended by staff and without further discussion. Item number four, 3801 Pleasant Avenue, Ward 8. This application is for a certificate of appropriateness. Item number four is recommended for consent unless someone wants to speak in opposition to or modify the staff recommendation. Item number five is Falls Initiative Project Intensive Survey, Intensive Architectural History Survey and Traditional Cultural Property Survey. Uh, this application is for review and comment pursuant to Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Item number five will be discussed without a public hearing. So the proposed agenda, a consent agenda item will include the following. Item number four, 3801 Pleasant Avenue, Ward 8. Is there any opposition from commissioners to the staff recommendations for this item? Commissioner Melblum. Chair Howard, I'd like to remove that and have a discussion about that item. Okay, thank you very much. So the following item will have staff presentation, public comment and commission discussion and action. Item number four, 3801 Pleasant Avenue, Ward 8. The following item will have staff presentation and commission discussion without a public hearing. That's item number five, the Falls Initiative Project Intensive Architectural History Survey and Traditional Cultural Property Survey. Commissioners may have a motion to approve the proposed agenda. Bjornberg so moves. Thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg is a second. Melblum second. Thank you, Commissioner Melblum. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? The agenda is approved. Our next order of business is to approve the minutes from our August 8th, 2023 meeting. May I have a motion to approve those minutes? Sambolt so moved. Thank you, Vice Chair Sambolt. Is there a second? Bjornberg second. Thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Van der Eyck abstains. Thank you. Abstains. Thank you, Commissioners Van der Eyck and Booty. The minutes are approved. Before I open the public hearing to public comments, let me summarize the process. Uh, we will take each of the agenda items in order for the public hearing item. Planning staff will present its report and then commissioners will be asking questions of staff. Then I will open the public hearing and we will hear from the applicant and commissioners may ask questions of that applicant. After that, we invite public comment. If you wish to speak, you need to do two things. Please be sure to sign up on the sheet that's over by the clerk. If you haven't done this already, you can do so afterwards. And when you come up to testify, you must state your name and address for the record. Please keep your comments specific to the application that's before us today. If you have any materials to hand out, you'll also have to give those to our committee clerk so that they can be distributed to the commission and entered into the public record. Do not approach the commissioners on the dais. After the public comments are complete, I'll close the hearing and commissioners will deliberate and act on the application before us. So our first item is item number four, 3801 Pleasant Avenue. Ward 8, the application is for a certificate of appropriateness and the staff report is presented by Dr. John Smoley.
Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is John Smoley, and I'm pleased to be before you this evening to brief you on a certificate of appropriateness to add one accessible ramp, construct one new food shelf storage building, and remodel one at attached garage at 3801 Pleasant Avenue in the Church of the Incarnation Historic District. The applicant seeks to provide an accessible means of ingress and egress to the lower level of the church, currently served by stairs, by providing an exterior ramp at the north facade. Here's a top-down view of the property itself. The ramp is proposed to be over here on the north side of the property adjacent to 38th Street West. They also propose to construct a new garage and food shelf storage building at the rear of the lot behind the rectory to expand the church's existing food shelf. Here you can see the existing rectory. The new food shelf storage building is proposed to be built here at the back of the lot adjacent to the alley. Last but not least, the church proposes to construct a small addition to the garage turned food shelf at the rear of the lot. Here at the rear adjacent to the alley. In terms of public comment, staff has received no comments on the proposed project. Any additional correspondence that we receive, well, you would have that now. In terms of the findings for the Certificate of Appropriateness, the application meets all findings except one. The Church of the Incarnation Historic District Design Guidelines, adopted by the HPC in 2018, states under Section J, New Additions to Existing Buildings, number two, new additions shall be designed in a manner that makes clear what's historic and what is new. In accordance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards, additions shall be compatible, subordinate, reversible, and inconspicuous with limited visibility from the public right-of-way. The proposed cooler addition shown here, will affect the rear facade of the attached garage turned food shelf that is permitted to be removed by the HPC's design guidelines. The proposed 34 foot wide by nine foot five inch deep one story cooler addition, which you can see a rendering of here. And I'll point out where the garage currently stands now and that nine foot five inch deep addition placed again at the rear of the property adjacent to the alley. This will cover most of that garage building segment's eastern or rear facade, making it difficult to see from the public right of way in accordance with the design guideline. The small size of the cooler addition will remain clearly subordinate to the over four story church, which you can see in the background of the rendering here, to which it's proposed to be attached. Exterior brick on this elevation will be removed and salvaged for reuse, reuse in the addition's wainscoting proposed to be capped in a narrow two inch band of limestone, which will demonstrate compatibility with the adjacent historic one car garage stall, while differentiating it from that garage stall's 14 inch limestone band. Here's the historic one car garage with its 14 inch limestone band, much wider than the uh, smaller two inch band of limestone atop the proposed wainscoting on the uh, proposed addition. Smooth, hardy panels on the addition's walls will further demonstrate compatibility with a historic one-car garage. On this addition's east or rear side adjacent to the alley, the applicant proposes to install hardy panels designed to resemble garage doors, which you can see here in sort of a gray color. To prevent these from looking like garage doors, which will create a false sense of history, staff recommends the project be conditioned to ensure the wall panel design proposed for the addition's south side be extended across its eastern side. The application meets all other findings required by the city's heritage preservation regulations. So for that reason, CPED recommends the Heritage Preservation Commission approve the certificate of appropriateness to add one accessible ramp, construct one new food shelf storage building, and remodel one attached garage at 3801 Pleasant Avenue in the Church of the Incarnation Historic District, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. I'm available for any questions you may have, and I know the applicant is here uh, as well. 
Thank you for the report, Dr. Smolin. Commissioners, are there questions for staff? I'm not seeing any. I will now open the public hearing for this item. And I understand the applicant is here and would like to speak, so come on up. Name and address for the record. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Chair Howard, my name is Lauren Anderson, and I'm here with New History, the historic preservation consultants who are assisting the church with this application. Our um, business address is 575 Southeast 9th Street here in Minneapolis. Um, in addition to representatives from the church that are here today, I also have um, with me representatives from the design team, Snow Cry Lake Architects, um, and also Albertson Hansen Architecture. And we would respectfully request that the HPC approve our certificate of appropriateness for the proposed ramp, food shelf addition, and food storage garage, um, and adopt recommended staff conditions. I just want to provide a little bit more context um, on the locations that were um, determined upon and considered as we were uh, considering where to install these three items on the church property, um, just to provide a little more context to what staff previously shared. Um, in regard, regarding the ramp, you'll see the site plan in front of you um, there on your screen. Um, so the, in addition to the north facade, um, which is where the ramp is currently proposed, the applicant also looked at installing a ramp um, on the south or the east side of the church. Um, you can see, excuse me as I try to work the uh, mouse and speak into the microphone. <laughs> you can see that on the east side of the property, the alley right-of-way conflicts with any ramp addition that could be put on there in addition um, to the fact that below grade excavation would be required to access the lower level at that point. Um, similarly, the south side of the church does have a very steep staircase um, that provides access to the lower level, but the size of that shaft is really too narrow to accommodate an existing ramp. Um, and there was a photo of that, that shaft in your uh, package that you received. Um, and then, of course, the west facade is the, the primary facade of the church facing um, Pleasant Avenue. Uh, in regards to the food shelf addition, um, the existing garage, um, which is now actually a, a food shelf, it was converted to a food shelf in 2020 um, through a certificate of no change um, that went before staff at that time. That uh, existing garage was chosen as the location for the food shelf addition, not only because it currently functions as a food shelf, um, but because that is a really architecturally uh, insignificant component of the church's campus. Um, as uh, staff mentioned, the church's period of significance does go through 1963 and includes um, the construction of this garage. However, it was not designed by Masqueray, who designed the church, and really uh, it doesn't contribute to the church's architectural significance, which is why this location was chosen. Um, and specifically installing the addition on the east side of the garage where we have those existing door openings allows for a really economical um, construction where we can reuse those existing openings to provide access to the cooler. Um, finally, the food storage garage, um, which will be installed at the southeast corner of the lot. Uh, that corner of the lot is the uh, section of the property that was specifically identified in the design guidelines as appropriate for accessory structures. Um, and so that's why that location was chosen. Uh, the church also did look at trying to evaluate its existing interior space to see if they could accommodate more food storage at the interior rather than constructing a new building. However, that um, available space is really limited to the lower level of their rectory building, um, which is not accessible um, and is not workable for food deliveries um, and distribution. In closing, um, the all three of these items were really designed um, to, first of all, increase accessibility to the church, particularly to its elderly residents, and also to provide expanded capacity for its food uh, storage and distribution program, um, which has really been growing over the past three years. And the church has been working with city preservation staff and other city staff for the past several years to plan for these improvements uh, to the property. Um, we'll remain available for questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for those comments. Commissioners, are there any questions for the applicant? I don't see any. Are there any members of the public who wish to speak for or against this application? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Commissioners, let's discuss. Yeah, 
I'd like <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that I need to recuse myself from this item, so I will not be involved in the discussion or the vote. Thank you, Vice Chair Sandbolt. Other comments, Commissioner Moblum. Um, thank you, Chair Howard. I, I support this completely uh, this proposal except for the panels. Um, they feel gratuitous um, and I feel that they create a false sense that, they're, that the garage actually had importance. Um, it wasn't part of the um, historical fabric uh, of the, of the um, designation and it seems like this is giving them a false sense of importance. And I recognize the applicant said that, uh, or I think Dr. Smalley said that the applicant wasn't trying to imitate garage doors, but I think almost anybody who would drive by there would think that they were garage doors. So I would approve of this, but I think that we should, they should get rid of the, the panels facing the alley. Thank you, Commissioner Moblum. If I understand the condition correctly, and maybe Dr. Smoley can be clear what, what can help clarify, I think the idea is to get rid of the faux garage doors entirely and take that um, wall treatment that's on the south side and take it along the east. Would that be both the, um, the wall panel design as well as the Rick? Uh, Madam Chair, the condition itself states that the proposed wall panels, which you see here in gray, um, shall not retain that same pattern. That the panels on the south side, which you see here in dark brown, those would be wrapped around. There's no specifications regarding the wainscoting. The way staff anticipated it, it wouldn't, um, it really wouldn't extend around. Um, it would simply be a change in design of panels. Would that satisfy your concerns, uh, Commissioner Melbourne? So the wainscoting would stop those uh, painted hardy panels would be deleted? The painted hardy panels would be redesigned to resemble these, to match these dark brown panels on the southern side of the building. So the principal change would be that the, um, this sort of a four over four division, if you want to call it that, would just become a three part division, just like you see here. And that would extend down the side of the building and the, um, the brick wainscoting would not infill their base, that would remain open yeah. as it currently appears. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. For me, that would not satisfy me because I think it's still gonna read like a garage. Okay. They're gonna read like three garage doors, which that's, I think it's misrepresenting what they are. And you know, frankly, if this was somebody's piece of property anywhere in the city, they'd be able to do that. But because it's coming before us, I think it creates a false sense of use, which I think gives it more importance than it really is. So I would propose that those, I think what is more appropriate is that those light gray hardy panels be taken out, the wainscoting is consistent, and the, the kind of the, the, the brown panel pattern just repeats all the way across the east side. Thank you, Commissioner Melbourne, and thank you for the clarification, Dr. Smoley. Other thoughts from the commission? I do think it would be kind of awkward to have the, the hardy panel going down to the, the ground there, but I don't know that it's enough to, to change it. Um, d did you wanna try to put together a motion with a new condition? And then I'll look to our architects and see what they might be able to do. <laughs> I'll, I'll check their faces as it's read. 
No other commissioners have thoughts? I, I, I agree with staff. I think the, the uh, as it's currently designed, it is the, the faux garage door would be inappropriate. I think it does present a, a false sense of history. And no one has anything to say. All right. It's all up to you, Commissioner Moblem. No pressure. <laughs> Commissioner Booty, fill some space here. Thank you, Chair Howard. <laughs> I, I guess I'm curious, uh, maybe the applicant can jump in. Is, does that change the use of, of the new space at all? Um, if those hardy panels were no longer there in the redesigned form? I guess that's, maybe that's the another architect could <laughs> help uh, answer that. But um, I, that would be my concern, is that if that changes their the use of which is the purpose of building the new structure. Yeah, it, it's my understanding those white uh, doors are not usable, correct? Yeah, so it's just a change in design. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Moblum. All right, I'm gonna make an attempt at a motion here. Um, I propose that condition one be rewritten to say the east facade will be revised so the wainscoting is continuous along the east elevation with brick below and the brown panels above. I'm, I'm seeing nods that that's possible from the, the applicant. Um, other commissioners have thoughts on that or would someone like to second the motion? Commissioner Van Der Eyck. I second the motion. Yes. <laughs> Chair Howard and Commissioner Melbloom, can you restate the motion that you move to yep. staff recommendation with the modification to the condition? Yep, whole thing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, I, the, I would propose that the recommended motion read, the Heritage Preservation Commission approves the Certificate of Appropriateness to add one accessible ramp, construct one new food shelf storage building, and remodel one attached garage at 3801 Pleasant Avenue in the Church of the Incarnation Historic District subject to the following conditions. Condition one, the east facade is to be revised with the wainscot to be continuous on the east elevation with brick below and brown panels above, the hardy panels to be deleted. And then the other two conditions are as, as proposed by staff, conditions two and three. I'll just double check with Commissioner Van Der Eyck. Is that your second? Yes, I think it's still second. Okay. And I'm going to check one more time. I'm seeing nods from, yeah, okay. Um, let's see, any further discussion? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Bjornberg. Aye. Booty. Aye. Chair Howard. Aye. Mel Blum. Aye. Vice Chair Sample. Abstain. Struthers. Aye. Van der Eyck. Aye. There are six ayes and one abstention. Thank you, that motion passes. Our next item, I'm going to pass the baton over to Vice Chair Sandbolt to run as I have a conflict of interest as a part-time employee as the, of the Department of Transportation who has responsibilities related to the Stone Arch Bridge. So I'm just gonna sit here and let her run it. <laughs> yeah, with that, we'll move on to this agenda item. I believe we'll begin with the staff presentation. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Sandbolt and Commissioners. My name is Erin Kay, and I'm a city planner in the Historic Preservation Subsection of the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development, or CPED. I'm here today to introduce the Falls Initiative Project, which is undergoing a Section 106 review. The Minneapolis Heritage Preservation Commission is participating as a consulting party and is providing review and comments at different stages. I'll start with a brief project overview and then share the results from two cultural resources studies Representatives from the project team and the technical team are, are here today as well. 
Friends of the Falls and the City of Minneapolis are exploring opportunities for redeveloping the site of the Upper Lock at St. Anthony Falls. Friends of the Falls is a 501c3 public nonprofit focused on building understanding and embracing the value of indigenous perspectives related to Owamni Omni, which is the Dakota name for St. Anthony Falls. The lead federal agency for this project is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. A programmatic agreement among the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, and the City of Minneapolis has been drafted and is currently under review. In the Section 106 process, we are at step two with the identification of historic properties. In fall 2022, consultants from 106 Group prepared an archaeological and architectural history literature review and assessment to understand what cultural resources have already been identified in the vicinity of the project area and what else may need to be studied. The consultants recommended that an intensive architectural history survey of the upper St. Anthony Falls lock and dam complex should be conducted to understand whether or not it is eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, or NRHP. This area is located within the NRHP listed and locally designated St. Anthony Falls Historic District, but it had not been studied as an individual resource. Here's an aerial view of the upper St. Anthony Falls lock and dam complex, outlined in a green and black dashed line, which is from the intensive architectural history survey report prepared by 106 Group. The complex was built between 1959 to 1963 and contributed to the development of barge terminals and other industries upstream of St. Anthony Falls on the Mississippi River. It was built as part of a 4.6 mile extension of the nine foot channel project that allowed river navigation to reach north and northeast Minneapolis. The design of the complex reflects the collaboration between the US Army Corps of Engineers, engineers at the University of Minnesota, geologists at the US Geological Survey, and others. The design responded to the various engineering challenges of its site and functional needs of the complex. The consultants found that it has historical significance and retains integrity to convey this significance. Specifically, the survey recommends the complex as individually eligible for listing in the NRHP under Criterion A in the areas of transportation, maritime history, industry, and commerce, and under Criterion C in the area of engineering. The recommended period of significance under Criterion A is 1963 to 1976, and the recommended period of significance under Criterion C is 1959 to 1963. The intensive architectural history survey included 21 properties associated with the complex, among which 13 are recommended as contributing and eight are recommended as non-contributing because they were built before or after the period of significance. And the component properties are shown here on this map with orange signifying contributing and yellow signifying non-contributing. Concurrent to the study, Blondo Consulting LLC conducted a traditional cultural property survey of Owamni Omni. Per National Register Bulletin 38, a traditional cultural property, or TCP, is an area with significance based on association with cultural practices, traditional beliefs, lifeways, arts, crafts, or social institutions, which are rooted in a traditional community's history and are important for continuing cultural identity of the community. The Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam falls within the boundary of Owamni Omni, as shown here. This site is significant to the Dakota community on whose ancestral homeland the city of Minneapolis was built. As part of the study, the consultant team engaged with members from all four recognized Minnesota Dakota communities with the goal to document stories and practices, not evaluate and validate them. Owamni Omni has significance for its connection to water, which is important to the Dakota community. Water helps sustain life, facilitates travel, serves as a boundary, and is used in ceremonies. As noted by the consultant, Owamni Omni is a natural feature that has been used, modified, and even exploited by European Americans. Ultimately, a community that values a place must determine the property's significance. The very definition of a TCP embraces the fact that it is a functional and dynamic, not static property type. As the Dakota, a living traditional community, still associates the area with traditions, beliefs, and lifeways, Owamni Omni is an example of a TCP. The study recommends Owamni Omni as eligible under Criterion A for the association with traditional cultural practices, specifically oral tradition and storytelling and language. 
under criterion B for its association with the being or spirit, unktehi, under criterion C for its place as an integral part of a larger collection of related sites in association with a river, and could be considered eligible under criterion D for the potential to yield information within ethnographic and folklore studies. The study also asserts that Awamni Omni retains integrity. The study recommends the following next steps. Continued coordination and consultation with Native communities, especially the Dakota, issuance of a formal determination of eligibility by the US Army Corps of Engineers, completion of an assessment of effects, further research, and nomination and listing of Awamni Omni in the NRHP. Staff have reviewed the reports and concur with the results. And we can transmit any comments from the HBC to the US Army Corps of Engineers and SHPO in a letter. The reports have not yet been submitted to SHPO, but will be soon. This concludes my presentation, and the project team would also like to make a brief presentation and is available to take questions. Do I need to grant them permission? <laughs> yes, I, I, we would like to hear your presentation um, regarding this item. Amataka Yepi, Chante Washtea Nape Chiu Japi, Dakota Ia Patewichoda Makiapie, Washichu Ia Shalibaka Makiapie. Hello, my relatives. I greet you with a good heart and handshake. My Dakota name is Manny Buffalo. My English name is Shelly Buck. I am the president of Friends of the Falls and also the vice president of the Prairie Island Indian Community Tribal Council. My address is 748 Linden Circle South, Maplewood 55119. First, I'd like to say thank you for allowing us the time to speak today, I appreciate it. It is common to think about or talk about preservation in terms of buildings, bridges, and other structural properties. We understand your mission, and we ask you and invite you to see it through an indigenous lens. I always say you can't talk about Minnesota history without first starting with Dakota history. Many tribes have a migration story, to where they're currently located, but the Dakota call the land that is now Minnesota the birthplace. Our creation stories have us coming from into human form from the waters here in Minnesota. Uh, two locations are Bedote, which is near Fort Snelling, and the other is Bidet Wakan, or Spirit Lake, which is now known as Malax or Lake Malax. So those two are our place of creation. So many Wachoni, water is life, literally, for us. The area of Awamidi Omni, or St. Anthony Falls, and Witawanahi, or Spirit Island, was significant to the Dakota people long before it was industrialized. It was an area for prayer and giving thanks. Witawanagi was even a place that some Dakota women would go to give birth. This area was known by other tribes to be a sacred area for the Dakota people, and they respected that. It was a place that opposing tribes could come together to have a neutral site to talk over things. That's how much power this area had. All too often, indigenous sites are deemed ineligible for listing due to factors such as significant disturbance or even a dismissal of our oral histories. Things are slowly changing, however, like with the mini Oweshni, which is uh, cold water springs. Just because a site has been disturbed or destroyed doesn't mean that spirit, that life force, doesn't still exist there, because it does. The integrity of this site as a historic Dakota landmark persists to this day. We still have ceremonies there that we conduct. There's still uh, Dakota people that go and pray there and give thanks there. The his historic significance needs to be broadened to pre-industrial. Within the St. Anthony Falls Historical District, that's a mouthful, the history of saw milling and flour milling is already well known and taught all over the area. But the Dakota history is invisible. We as Dakota people are invisible in our own homelands.
we as Dakota have a different view of the world. We see the land, the water, plants, and animals as our relatives with a life force. Mitakuye Owasi, we are all relatives. I'd like to now turn it over to Chirsti. Thanks, Shelley. Sorry, made me emotional. It's been a real honor. Sorry. Oh my God, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's been an honor to work with with Shelley on this project. And um, sorry, I just got to get it together here. That really hit me. Let me get into the wonky stuff, and that'll calm me down. Um, so yeah, I. Uh, HPC is a consulting party on this process with the Corps. And one thing that wasn't mentioned earlier is that Friends of the Falls is working very closely with the city on the conveyance. We're a cost-sharing partner, and we're also the managing partner and, and kind of navigating that process on behalf of both the city and the park board and working closely through Shelley with the tribes. Um, the subject property that is currently described uh, as part of the conveyance includes land at the upper uh, lock, but no structures. So the lock itself will remain in federal ownership, but the land would be conveyed. As Shelley mentioned, in recent years, there has been a turning tide of awareness uh, of, of this pre-contact, pre-industrial history Here's an example. Uh, Minneapolis commissioned a Native American context statement, um, which was done by Two Pines in 2016. The overall map there on the left uh, shows the trails and settlements that um, have been documented. And then the inset on the right is the site that we're talking about. And you can see right there at the falls uh, was a campsite, a village, a campsite, you know, that gathering place that Shelley spoke of. There was a portage there. Um, Witawanahi, Spirit Island, is noted. Uh, so this was a destination. This was a known place. Additionally, the update to Power of the Falls, the West Bank plan, um, which is a, a Heritage Board plan, uh, now includes mention of this as a significant Dakota place, uh, largely thanks to Mona Smith, who also serves on the board of Friends of the Falls. She's been engaged in this planning process for many years um, and has brought this uh, much more into focus uh, in these plans. You heard about Unktehi um, in the TCP, which I'm sure you've all had a chance to peruse. Uh, there are a number of Unktehi associated locations, locations which have been defined. They're here, and I think what what you see is just how significant and how unique that this is one of those sites. Um, Owamni Omni is an Unktehi associated location. Now, we also wanted to make you aware of some of the challenges that we'll be facing uh, as this site moves forward into decision making around historic resources. It has been deemed eligible both as an industrial complex and as a TCP. Uh, the project vision is really associated with lifting up that indigenous history, that Dakota history, which, as Shelley said, has been invisible uh, in the historic district until now. This is an incredible opportunity to work to, to, to cure that um, and to bring this history forward, this living culture forward. Um, I'm noting here a couple of issues that are going to come back to you at some point. Um, there's two structures on the site that are within the subject property to convey. One, uh, the one that looks like a baseball diamond is, is a bathroom facility, and the other one that's attached to the lock wall is the old control station, which is no longer in use. The core has two new structures on top of the lock where they control uh, the tainter gate and, and other aspects. However, the control station does have utilities running through it. Um, you'll note too in this image, and I'll just point here for a sec. Let's see, there's my little arrow here. If you can see that, 
the control station is at an elevation that's much higher than the level of the ground. So there's a huge gravel slope. And we'll take another look at that. There's a huge gravel slope that kind of makes up the difference there. Um, meaning that if those buildings remain, they don't just constrain the footprint of the building. In order to access and maintain those buildings, they actually constrain almost the entire site because of the grading and the, and the gravel. You'll see too noted on this first image, there's an elevation of plus 810 at the end of the Stone Arch Bridge and plus 750 at the southern end of the site at the water. The idea of restoring the site, both environmentally and culturally, means regrading the site. And so again, uh, just calling to your attention that those two structures are very likely to be uh, demolished, removed, if we move into the future uh, vision of the site that's anticipated. Here's another image of that gravel slope, and you can see encountering, all, uh, you know, it goes all the way to the footings of the Stone Arch Bridge. So um, I want to bring Shelley back up to close out, but I think just we really wanted to contextualize some of the issues that are coming. Um, you know, these are, there are two histories uh, overlapping, and, and but, but one has been invisible, and so we, we hope that we can um, move toward lifting up that pre-contact history as the significant history to be interpreted and restored on this site. And I'll bring up um, Shelley one more time. Just to reiterate, this site is significant to the Dakota people. You have an opportunity to support us in ensuring that the Dakota history is told and experienced here. Again, I want to say Padama Yayepi. Thank you to each and every one of you for taking the time to listen to us about our project and the possibilities here um, for the, the waterways and to add another piece of history to this site. Padama Yayepi. Thank you very much for your presentation, um, both staff and, and for the applicant, I guess <laughs> I'll say, um, for your time and coming in tonight and giving us a little more context on the project. Um, our goal tonight is to provide feedback and comment to SHPO as a consulting party to this. Um, they appreciate our feedback and concerns and comments. Um, so commissioners, let's uh, provide some comment that could be provided to SHPO. Commissioner Bjornberg. Um, so I will start off by saying thank you for the presentations, but also I was really excited to see a TCP study come across. Um, I feel like I'm always excited to see that um, and really trying to acknowledge history that isn't necessarily just building or structure based. Um, so absolutely support sort of moving both of these studies forward, um, and I would say really encouraging the sort of next steps that are outlined um, to follow this in the process and um, have it listed as a TCP. Other commissioners? Commissioner Struthers. Thank you. Um, I have still a context question, and it arose initially out of the report uh, the staff report, and, and I, th I found all this very interesting. I read the reports that were attached and as well as the staff report, but the first sentence of the report says, Friends of the Falls and the City of Minneapolis are exploring opportunities for redevelopment of the site of the upper lock at St. Anthony Falls. And then in the next paragraph, it says, um, Oh, no, it's in the same paragraph at the end. It says, a programmatic agreement among the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office and the City of Minneapolis has been drafted and is currently under review. Are those things related to not just the designation but the ultimate use of that property? Erin, thanks for stepping up. Vice Chair Sandvold and Commissioner Struthers, thank you for that question. As Jersey was alluding to, this is a very complex project. So 
There are multiple property owners who are um, involved. So uh, the U.S. Army Corps is responsible for the lock and dam. Um, Tracy also mentioned involvement from the city of Minneapolis and the park board just with this location mm -hmm. um, along the river. And so um, the, they are exploring a possible land conveyance um, from the U.S. Army Corps to the city of Minneapolis. Um, and then also a possible transfer to the Friends of the Falls organization. Um, explaining that at a high level, um, I don't know if Andrea Burke wants to add anything or also if Tiersey and Shelley would want to add anything to clarify. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the programmatic agreement is not about use, not, not about future use, it's really about process. Oh. So of course it covers the required NEPA compliance and we've achieved phase one, phase two, and TCP, um, which Friends of the Falls uh, supported as the cost sharing partner. And so, and we kind of teed up, I think, some of the issues that are facing us in phase three, because we think we're gonna end up at mitigation. Um, so all of that to say, uh, I think the programmatic agreement is primarily to do with the conveyance of the property and impacts to core operations. Um, it's likely that if the control station goes away, we would be relocating utilities, for instance. So that would be covered under that as a process matter. But it would also have to come to historic bodies, you know, for consideration, including the SHPO, ACHP, and HPC. Um, so we're, we're kind of trying to contextualize that question for you. In terms of future use, that is still underway, still being planned. However, we do know that um, based on uh, all of the input thus far from uh, an assembled Native Partnership Council, as well as what we've heard so far from tribal leadership, restoration is really the most important thing. So um, Shelley talked about uh, water is life, we are all relatives, that the site would be returned to all relatives as a resource. So as you may know, this is uh, part of the Mississippi Flyway. This site, um, if brought back to life through restoration, and if it became an indigenous landscape again, you know, oak barrens next to running water, that many species could benefit. And so um, we are working toward a restoration of the site uh, to an indigenous landscape as, as really both a cultural and environmental restoration. If, if that, I would say that's not final. There's a lot yet to come ahead of us, but Thank you. I would say that's the direction. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Andrea Burke, would you like to add some comments? Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair Sambleton and Commissioner Struthers. I wanted to provide just a little extra, walk it back just a little bit further, just to um, add on to what Aaron and uh, Chair Steve mentioned. Um, the reason this is a little different than what normally comes before you, because it falls under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, of which the HPC is a consulting party, of which the staff acts on behalf of. For some of these larger projects, we bring them to you for review and comment. The Army Corps owns the property, and in their transfer or conveyance, excuse me, let me use the right word, the conveyance to the city, which then um, has an agreement with the Friends of the Falls for that layers on top of that, that act in and of itself is a what's called an undertaking under Section 106. And so that is what is kind of this entire project of um, defining the undertaking, looking for historic properties, a determining effect. It's a, essentially it's a four-step process um, dictated under the National Historic Preservation Act, and we are at part of it. This has been going on for a while. There's a larger um, related project, excuse me, that, that deals with the disposition study that the Army Corps is looking at for this property. That's kind of being handled a little bit separate than this particular conveyance. Um, but the programmatic agreement that's being referenced is a way to conclude this very large, complicated process, and it is a tool that's available under the National Historic Preservation Act to um, conclude Section 106 in situations of complicated 
projects or where the effects of such a project are unknown, which is in this case. And so the programmatic agreement in and of itself actually details a process for how to carry out 106 responsibilities when there isn't um, a defined outcome at this point in time. So at this point, there's still a lot of, as Chirsty was mentioning, there's a lot of ideas and proposals and um, and all of it can be accounted for under the, the programmatic agreement once all parties are in consensus about it. But, um, but the kind of the purpose to bring it before you this evening was to introduce you to the project, introduce you to kind of what's going on. Um, I will mention in terms of um, 106 and, and local regulatory authority are still um, in dubious territory. And so in terms of where where and or if this comes before you in certain um, regulatory cap capacity, I would say, is, is still unknown at this point because it, it is the Army Corps that runs the show under Section 106. So I hope that provides maybe another, another step walking back to just sort of provide a bit of a context for, for the reason of bringing it before you today. Andrea, as a follow-up question to that, would it be most appropriate for us to be commenting on the process as outlined in in this memo, or are we commenting on our thoughts about the conveyance of the property to the city of Minneapolis, or are we kind of commenting on how we feel prioritizing the historic significance of the two potential kind of periods of significance as outlined? Um, what would be our best focus for our comments? Vice Chair Sample, I think kind of anything goes. I mean, at this point, the project is still in the identification stage of it. Um, as laid out, the, the programmatic agreement is kind of happening concurrently. It has not been signed yet. Um, it's been happening for a while. The Advisory Council is participating. But I would say, you know, whatever you want to comment on, on what's been per given to you, what you're aware of, what they've presented, I think is all... Um, is all appropriate in the context of this. And, you know, staff has been participating heavily along the way. And also just to mention, the city of Minneapolis and the HPT are two different consulting parties on this project representing similar but different interests. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, do any of the commissioners have questions at this point for Andrea based on the information she just provided us? Let's start there. Commissioner Bjornberg. I don't necessarily have a question, but you know, I just heard that you know how the 106 process plays out and our involvement is not clear. Um, and like totally get that, I'm totally fine. Would absolutely appreciate updates as this project continues to go along, even if we are not directly involved. Yeah, happy to, thank you. With that, commissioners, other comments that you would like to, Commissioner Melbloom. Thank you, Vice Chair Sandbolt. Um, I do have a couple questions. Are there, and maybe these are directed to Aaron, might be the easiest answer, you may not be able to. Are there a lot of such overlapping districts such as this in the United States, or is this unique to have the TCP and the and the, the kind of this industrial um, historic district be overlapping. Thank you, Vice Chair Sambold and Commissioner Mel Bloom. Um, that is, uh, uh, th so I'll say this is the first traditional cultural property survey that I personally have read in my professional experience. Um, I know that the, the TCP study noted um, that there have been there are four other sites in the Twin Cities metropolitan area mm -hmm. that have been identified as TCPs, one of which Oheawahi or Pilot Knob was listed in the National Register in 2017. And so um, I think the, I don't know that I can answer your specific question about the overlap of an industrial district and TCPs across mm -hmm. the country. You know, I think as Shelley was saying, water is life and, and that value of the water has been seen across cultures, right, and cities formed around areas where there was water power and those sorts of things. Um, so I guess maybe to wrap that up and say, I don't, I, I can't answer the question directly. Um, I also know that 
I think at several have noted that the practice of identifying TCPs, um, in my opinion, has not been as robust as identifying other properties, especially buildings and structures associated with historic district, uh, as, as historic districts, and so that may be something we continue to see more of and see more partnerships um, in evaluating those studies. I know that the, the bulletin to guide how to identify traditional cultural properties um, has been undergoing revisions. I'm not quite sure when the National Park Service, Service will um, release a final version, um, but this seems to be something that is getting more focus and intention. Thank um, you. And I don't, we could, that we could ask the technical team if you want further information, but that may be sufficient. Yeah, actually, actually uh, Vice Chair Sandbolt Ann Katz looks like she might have something to yeah. speak, say to that. <laughs> she could. Yes, yes, Ann, if you would like to speak. Thanks, Erin. Uh, Since you haven't spoken yet, please state your name and address for the record. Personal address, not business address. Business address is fine. Okay, Ann Ketz, 106 Group, 1295 Bandana Boulevard, Suite 335, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, Vice Chair, Commissioners, thank you for this opportunity to just answer your specific question. Um, there is a similar, though somewhat different, situation actually with Wakan TP. So uh, some years ago, um, we were part of the early development of what at that point in time was called the Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary. And part of that included beginning with literature reviews and then further evaluation of resources. What came out of that was the identification, excuse me, not the identification, the, the re-emergence of our understanding of what at the time was called Carver's Cave and is the Dakota name is Wakan Tipi. And that was determined eligible for the National Register actually under very similar criteria as Omni Omni. It was under criterion A and also B for Unktehi, and it appeared on the map that you saw. Um, it has not yet been listed, but there is tremendous interest among um, uh, the tribes to find funding to enable it to be listed. And some of you may have been following what's happened with the whole transition of the Wakan TP project to become a Dakota-led and managed property. It's a remarkable story of um, re-emergence. What happened, though, during those studies, there is also a historic brewery. There was an archaeological site that still survives um, right outside where the cave, um, and then there was a second cave as well, actually, that's just hidden. Um, so there was archaeology on uh, the brewery, and there was quite a lot of conversations about the appropriateness of interpreting a brewery so close to a sacred cave, um, there were also other sites of um, not quite as um, so much historical significance. But it's worth looking at the Wakan Tipi story. Uh, and if you just Google it, um, there's some really wonderful background information. And um, Maggie um, Lorenz is also is the director of the Wakan Tipi pro uh, program and project. And she's actually on the board um, with Friends of the Falls, so um, she's also a, a great conduit for sharing the story of what happened there, is happening there, it's very current. Yeah. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of other questions. Um, so, and again, maybe Aaron would be the best to answer this. So, am I correct that if these are both approved as historic? Um, historic districts, I guess for lack of a better term, I'm not sure exactly that's, that's the right term, but would that mean that there are five different historic entities that all overlap, if I'm understanding this correct? There'd be the TCP, the lock and dam piece, and then aren't there three separate for the St. Anthony Falls? Vice Chair Samuel, Commissioner Melbourne, I'm going to break your question down into two parts. So with the identification of historic property stage of the Section 106 process, um, the result of that is to, to determine are there any historic properties. Historic properties in a Section 106 definition are those that are either listed in the National Register or determined eligible for listing in the National Register. So the outcome of submitting these reports to SHPO will be 
um, does, does SHPO and does the US Army Corps as the lead federal agency concur with the consultant's recommendation that we have the upper St. Anthony Lock and Dam, is that determined eligible for listing? Mm -hmm. And then is there a TCP? Is that also eligible for listing? And at, at that point in the Section 106 process, it is not a requirement for compliance to be able to take it forward to listing. So it is not necessarily that there will be an outcome that something could get designated further. I think there's been some discussion about those next steps, and there may be an interest um, among various parties that Awamni Omni be listed in the National Register. That's definitely an outcome that could happen. We just don't know at this point kind of where that's going to go. So if you want to think kind of in hypotheticals about this, um, so we have the St. Anthony Falls Historic District, which is listed in the National Register. It's also a local historic district. Um, we would have the upper St. Anthony Lock and Dam could be a determined eligible property. Again, it could be pursued further to be listed, maybe not. Um, there's the TCP, and then I know there's also been studies of a greater, and uh, what is the full name? The Greater Lock and Dam Historic District that includes multiple locks and dams along the river that has also been determined eligible. So I think that gets to the five. There could also be more. So it's certainly, I guess maybe to answer your question simply, Yes, there could be all these layers of historical significance, and there could be more layers that could be identified in the future with different historic associations. Thank you. It's, there's a lot to, certainly a lot to think about. Does the, does the structure of the lock and dams detract from the TCP, or, or, do, or are they seen as, I, I, I feel like, they're somewhat represented that they are, but I, I'm curious if that's ac if that's an accurate way to look at this, or do they just exist side by side, so to speak, or does one actually really negatively influence the other? Are you maybe getting to the the integrity of the yeah of the sites? That's probably a good way to put it. Yeah, sure. It seems like they both have integrity, but. They're not existing in isolation. They're actually slammed right next to one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you the, evaluate the integrity, it's related to the historical significance, right? So between the Architectural History Survey and the, and the Traditional Cultural Property Survey, they are each asserting different areas of significance and different reasons for significance. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think with the results of the surveys is that they both do retain integrity, and I think maybe the answer that's coming to my mind is, is both and. These things can okay. exist, and um, in the professional opinion of the consultants, um, the presence of one has not detracted significantly to the presence of the other, that, neither, that either one or both don't retain their historical significance. Thank you. That's for me, that's really helpful. Um, I had one other question. Um, in the in the 106 groups proposal, the they recommended the period of significance um, be go to for criteria go from 1963 to 1976 which represents the year in which the complex was open for river traffic, and it's the, the year that the lock peaked. Why would that date be selected versus any other date? Is that, I, I was curious about that. It's a minor detail, but it made me curious. Are you asking about the start and end date of the period, or just one? Just the end date. The end date. Um, I don't know if, if Anne would like to answer that one, but I can make uh, I can make an attempt at it, and we can see if you have further questions. If, if it's yeah. too, if it's too picky, no, 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 no. that's okay. So. Um, so you know the I think we've had conversations in the past with other properties, just kind of questioning the, the idea of a period of significance, right, and and what that matter um, and why that matters and how you determine it, and the in my reading of the report. Um, it's really focusing on how did this structure 
help bring to fruition this, this long plan of increasing access um, for industrial transportation along this. And so, um, you know, under criterion A, I think, I would imagine it's looking at, you know, okay, when, when was the construction completed such that the idea, ideal was fully realized, mm -hmm. and then for how long did it serve its full purpose and create that big connection um, along the length of the Mississippi River? Um, and so I think the, the peak, that 1976 year refers to the peak, um, I believe it was like the peak of traffic and kind of activity along the river. And so it seemed like, you know, this is really, this, these are the years that make sense to reflect that, that period of activity. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Van Der Eyck, do you have a comment, question, concern? Um, I, I, this process it seems very confusing. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm having a tough time providing comment because I don't know that I'm fully following what you guys are looking for from us, but um, I guess I would say generally I am in support and agreement with uh, the findings of these reports uh, for the um, significance. Um, I don't know much about a traditional cultural property, um, and that's on me for not researching this prior to my duty here today, but um, so I guess the only thing I would wanna maybe understand a little bit more, um, and I think it's probably a pretty simple answer, is does, does a TCP typically come with design standards then, or how is that treated from, uh, like assuming that a, a future use happens within this TCP, how is that guided under, and is it, would it be under our purview? Vice Chair Sambal, Commissioner Randrake, thank you for that question. Um, I think uh, Andrea Burke was getting into that a little bit, just with yeah. the complexities of the local and regulatory review. So right. um, the, you know, section 106 reviews are focused on National Register eligibility, right. and so as the Heritage Preservation Commission and and staff with the Heritage Preservation Commission, we don't have regulatory authority over um, National Register properties, whether eligible or or listed. Um, I am not personally familiar with the practice of traditional cultural properties and the potential of having design standards and what that would look like, and so I would look to my colleagues and or the technical team if they can add anything in there. But I will just say before I pass it over, you know, I think it, it does come back to that, um, whether or not there is a local, a local regulatory hook in right. that. And also I think how the Section 106 process plays out um, in terms of if there are going to be adverse effects to historic properties, how does the lead federal agency and SHPO and the consulting parties identify what is appropriate mitigation yep. and whether or not that would be something that would. Yeah, I think I'm following you. And I think I'm, I think that led me to the to the answer being that the only way that there would be design standards is if we designated it locally and that would be us opting into that. Um, and that at, at a national register level, it doesn't have design standards and nothing does, if it even were to get to that point. Um, Okay, I think I follow this. Um, so I think my comment for you is that I am in agreement and of support of the, um, the findings and the reports and um, look forward to hear more on the status. Um, I think these reports are well-researched and well-written and certainly a dumb real estate developer doesn't have a lot to add. So <laughs> I, will, uh, I will leave it to the experts to, to further the process from here, but I think uh, I appreciate the work so far and very supportive of the process so far. Commissioner Bjorn, <laughs> Commissioner Bjornberg. <laughs> um, I don't necessarily have another comment on this, but one of the things that I think this conversation sort of brings up um, is, you know, is there a way to locally designate TCPs? Um, and I don't think that that's a question for right now, but maybe something that we can have a conversation about at a future retreat, um, because I feel like this is something that we've talked about a little bit, um, and, you know, understanding that, um, National Register 
recognition doesn't necessarily translate to local designation. So just a thought. Thank you, Commissioner Bjornberg. Um, I'm going to weigh in with some of my own thoughts. Um, I am excited to see that the study of this area included um, a history of the, I'm going to butcher saying it, but Awam Niyomi. Um, I'm glad to see that multiple kind of periods of significance and multiple cultural um, perspectives were looked at um, when considering historic significance of this site. I think it's interesting to look at a site like this and think about how a river and waterfall along a river is important to multiple cultures for different reasons. And different cultures have a very different way of treating the, the places of significance to them. Um, you know, our culture has a history of um, taking a natural resource and exploiting it for, um, for industrialization and uh, use in that manner. Um, and so I'm, I'm glad to see that both of these have been brought forward. I can't think of another two periods that this site could be looked at from a potential historic significance that would rise to the level of these two periods that are currently being studied. Um, I would, I'm encouraged to see that um, SHPO, that there's next steps for both of them, um, that they are going to continue to be studied and that SHPO will be considering, considering both of them and that both of them are on a path to maybe be moved for national designation. I am excited to, to see how that continues. I think at this point we're kind of providing a little bit more feedback on the process rather than on, you know, whether or not um, they're um, designation and you know the the nuances of period of significance and those kinds of things. Um, so I'm I'm excited to see that both of them are going to be going forward and that there's next steps on both of those studies um, that will be followed up on. I am interested to see uh, you know we do have within the city of Minneapolis even um, overlapping historic districts and I know like one kind of takes precedence over the other. I'd be interested to see how that plays out long term for these two, if they both go forward, um, which which uh, district kind of takes precedence um, over the other, um, you know, personally. And I think this isn't um, necessarily, uh, you know, what we would put in kind of our HPC recommendation. But personally, I think, um, you know, I struggle a little bit with the industrial nature taking over and that being the precedent. Personally, I think it should be the history of the Dakota that should be important in this place and that I would like to see preserved. Um, it is interesting to walk around this area and to see how much of the natural is left. And I think we need to do everything we can to protect the natural character um, of this place because there's so little left. Um, I, I feel like that is very important. And so I'm, I'm happy to see that there are next steps on both of these studies and that both of them will carry forward and that both of them will be considered when it comes to the interventions that might be made, um, not just during the conveyance, but potentially afterwards by the owners of the site. Does anybody else have any other comments or um, before I ask if that's enough comment, Aaron, uh, for you to provide towards um, towards Shippo for this for this round of our comments? <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair Sambolt. Yes, I believe I have enough to to provide those comments to Shippo. Thank you. All right, I think that concludes that item. You can pass the baton back to me. That concludes our discussion items. Um, do commissioners or staff have any announcements or commission business to discuss? Start with staff. I have two quick announcements. Andrea Burke, um, Supervisor for Historic Preservation Team in CPED. Um, I just wanted to note that today at the Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee, the Brookwood Terrace, 
uh, designation study was um, recommended on for designation on consent and forwarded on to the city council. Um, so that is happening. And then also speaking of retreats, our next retreat is coming up, I believe, on October 5th. And so I will be sending out communication here for topics uh, within the next week or two. Um, other than that, uh, forgive me, a third topic. Um, as I had mentioned, the State Historic Preservation Office Preserve Minnesota statewide conference is happening the end of September in Mankato, and I encourage you all to attend um, that conference. No further updates. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any announcements? Not seeing none. Let's see. With that, and we have completed all items on the agenda for this meeting, I will ask members and staff one more time if there are any matters that must come before the commission. There being no other business to come before this meeting, and without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. The next regular meeting of the Heritage Preservation Commission is September 12th, 2023. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. <laughs>